It's exciting to be home. So as, uh, as many of you know, I've been away for the last 10 weeks or so. Um, been uh, living down in a dorm room in Boston. If you're over 25, don't ever do that. Man, it is, living in community that way is a unique experience. Um, it was a time of tremendous growth, you might say. I don't know if I would say that, but you might say that. Um, but the cool thing that happened over the course of summer, and Travis asked me this morning to kind of cover some of the things that we did this summer, um, was just being with 30 people who were strangers 10 weeks ago and who left just lamenting the fact that they weren't going to see each other again for a long time, <laughs> uh, and watching that community build. Because um, you can be fake for a week, you can be fake for two weeks, you can sometimes be fake for three. After about week four, all of a sudden, the toothpaste that you keep leaving in the bottom of the sink is going to be a problem for me. <laughs> so the masks come off. There's no perfect people anymore, because we're all dealing in our junk. And so living in community that way is sweet and hard and you have to share bathrooms, and that's another thing. But anyway, communal living at its finest. But what we did over the course of the summer in earnest was to sit and walk through with students some things that they probably have never heard before, regrettably in some instances. But as navigators, what we hope to do as we kind of begin to walk through this presentation this morning is five things. We want the students that come through our program to know how to walk with Jesus. You would be shocked, I hope you would be shocked, to learn that students that, even the ones that come out of churches and churches like ours, have no idea what it means to sit down and have a quiet time alone with God. What does it look like to spend time alone with God? Are we equipping our students to do this? Are you equipped to do this? This is a really important question for our church, I think, as well as for the students that we work with. Number two, that the, one of the marks of a disciple and a kingdom worker is that they know and they live from Scripture. Bible study needs to be a portion of what we're doing. I think we love to take the Scripture and put it into today's context and forget fully that the Bible can never mean what it never meant. The Bible's meaning doesn't change based on our culture. Number three, that our students would learn to live in community together. We got that one. Just by sticking us in the same hole for a little, I mean, it was lovely, really. <laughs> Number four, that students would learn to live out the gospel among those who don't believe. And that means that they actually have to have people that are not believers in their circles. There needs to be places in community where they actually interact with non-believers. Otherwise, the gospel stays pretty stagnant. And one of the really cool things about new believers is they actually believe that God is doing something. And number five, that a mature believer will reproduce spiritual generations, that there will be a fruit to the work that they do over the course of time. And so I'd like to walk through with you some of the things that we talked about this summer. And so I'm gonna invite you into an odd place. Um, I'd like to pretend with you that you are 22 years old and living in a dorm down at Boston University. I'm excited to tell you that in this reality, I weigh 210 pounds <laughs> and can still hit a shot from beyond the arch. Sometimes that's still true. Not the 210 pounds part, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but I'd like you to imagine that you're able to sit through this program with us and I'm just going to take you through one portion of what we did this summer. And the purpose for this is not to say, oh, and then we went to the promenade and watched fireworks. That's not what I'm talking about. I would like for, to inter interact with you around some of the hard conversations that we had throughout the course of the summer, which means that you're going to get to hear a bunch of hard conversations this morning. Um, and so for that, I apologize. Ish. So... We broke the summer into, f into four different parts. We spent two weeks talking about work in the workplace and what does that look like as believers within the framework of those five things that we just talked about. We talked a look at power 
and the uses of power, both systematically and within our own individual authority that we've been given wherever we might be. We talked about money and idols and greed, and we talked about generosity. And then we talked about sex, sexuality, marriage, and singleness in the last couple of weeks. And while we're not going to spend an awful lot of time on sex and sexuality this morning, I would encourage you, as you begin to meet with other people, as you share with each other how you have your quiet time, hopefully, so that we can begin to project this across this, this medium, that we wouldn't shy away from the things that may be considered graphic, because I think you see the gospel in real, live, amazing ways in the most graphic areas of life. Don't shy away from those places. All right, so you ready? You're going to get 11 mini-sermons in the next two hours <laughs> or so. Um, what does it look like to be a laborer for Jesus at work? I think we have a tendency to say that work is how I advance myself, how I become, how I, you can notice the theme warning in there, I, 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 work becomes I. And somehow in the middle of that, we forget that work is designed to glorify God. It was in place before the fall and will be in place once we're in glory. And it's an important thing. So let's walk through a couple of pieces of this. Number one, where you are is where God has placed you. You are not where you are by accident. In fact, if you look at Acts 17, it says, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he, being God, not me, determined the times set for them, in other words, the position in history that we exist, and the exact places that they should live. Why? God did this so men would seek him and perhaps find him, though he is never far from each one of us. If you're feeling out of place in this time, in this place, fear not. This is where God placed you on purpose. That's good news. Number two, God is rewiring your work and your attitude. That's a hard one, because I like to think that my attitude doesn't need rewiring ever. <laughs> I appreciate your silence more than you'll ever know. As <laughs> my wife sits there biting her lip. As a result of sin, and sin taints everything good, Work has become about making a name for ourselves and not about bringing God glory. Does that seem right? Work is the place where I can step away from normal life and step into a place where it's all about me. Step into a place where I can advance, where I can make sure I get the raise or the promotion, where I make sure I, and again, we're in that theme morning of I, 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 and we remove the glory from God and we place it on ourselves in our workplace if we're not careful. Does that mean that we don't do a good job? No, we'll talk about that in a moment. Number three, competence is uncommon. When we work to give glory to God, part of that means doing a good job. Work with skill. When people do work well, it blesses everyone around them. I think it's important to recognize that it's not just about being someplace. It's about the way we carry ourselves and the way that we do things. So work hard to do a good job at your job. Number two, work with integrity. Integrity is kind of being the same throughout. There's no place that bends more than someplace else. It's all the same, consistent across. We could talk about purity in the same way. But nothing changes at my workplace regardless of who's watching. I work with the same energy, effort, and integrity no matter what part of my work day it is. That type of work is uncommon, and that type of work blesses everyone around you. And then lastly, humility. Humility is not the opposite of pride, it's the opposite of self. One of the things that you'll notice is a common theme throughout, the, the, throughout these things. I have no desire for people to get smarter as a result of coming to our programs. My honest and earnest desire is internal transformation as they sit and they work through each of these things. The reality is these things are about people more than they're about tasks.
moving into what work that gives God glory. I, I want to define glory just briefly, and this is a really great definition that I heard over the summer. Glory is the visible expression of God's invisible reality. And it's really cool when you see the glory of God in other people. Imagine what it would look like that we did such a good job at our jobs that people saw the glory of God in how we acted. But I also will point out that that doesn't happen unless we go all the way back to the first slide and are deeply, intentionally connected with who God is, personally. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men so that they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And this was the question that we left How can I be the most loving, skillful person that I or anyone else knows at my job? So I leave that with you this morning. How can you be the most loving, skillful person that you or anyone else knows while you're at work? You'll notice we're raising the bar, not lowering it. We started talking about power and power structures, and we sat down and we watched a movie called 13th, which is about systematic uh, incarceration of African Americans in our country, and I do not want to even touch on politics this morning, but here's why we showed the movie. Not to talk about the politics, but to ask a simple question. Who determines where injustice lies? I love to look at things and go, no, 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 you're not suffering. You're not suffering. You're, yeah, yeah, great, I understand, but you're not suffering. And we have a tendency in New England to love to be stiff upper lip, pull yourself up by your bootstraps type of a posture, and remove emotion as much as possible from our thinking and from our decision making. And what that does, if we're not careful, is that it fully removes in every way outrage about injustice and it needs to exist somewhere in our thinking if we're gonna enter into injustice anywhere because it's about people, not politics, and not posture. And we as the body of Christ have got to be about people first. I do not wanna talk about the right and the wrong of this movie. It's made like every other documentary with a slant toward the producer. Great, I can live there. But I do want to ask a question sincerely. What does it look like for us to enter into injustice in a real way as the body of Christ? And that's a conversation that's far bigger than this morning, but it's one that we need to begin to have. What's the true use of power look like? The only person who can talk about real power is God himself. And I'd like to show you how God used his power as a perfect example of how to use power and authority. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him to the highest place, and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you would like to mirror what it looks like to have power and authority, please see here. Well, that doesn't mean that I'm supposed to be a doormat, does it? What do you think? I see a gospel where God gave up his right to be right for my sake. My goal and my hope as we work with students is that I and they would mirror that. My goal and hope for you as a body of Christ is that you would mirror that also. What if we became known as the people that don't care about being right? And the people that instead sacrifice ourselves in crazy and unusual ways for the sake of the gospel. What would our world look like? The next couple of weeks that we went through, we talked about money, 
and greed and idols, and we talked about generosity. And then we talked about singleness and marriage. For those of you that are mentoring younger folks, for those of you that are working with youth, I would encourage you in this way, if you are not talking about sex and money in those conversations, you're not gonna help anybody. It is a real reality of part of who we are in our culture, and if we're gonna work with our young people, that this needs to be an area that we not only look at, but focus on in a regular way. So the, this was titled Money and Greed. We could also talk about money and idols. They are pretty much the same in this regard. Who, what, where, how, and why. The reality of who is that greed is always about me, what I want. The what is that it's about my heart, not our wealth. Ultimately, I'm looking to satisfy something. You wanna know where greed and idolatry live in your lives? Where do you invest? Easily. Where do you pour money without thinking effortlessly? You show me that, I'll show you your idols clear out. But I don't need to look at it, you do. The how is that we use the things that we have as a place of comfort and security. These are the places where my value lies. These are the places where I go to to find rest and hope and they in every way become a replacer of everything that God has designed to do in our lives. So we had light conversations, easygoing, fun conversations this summer. We went to the fireworks at the Esplanade, listened to the Boston Pops, went to a Red Sox game. Light, easy, fun summer. (laughs) And I don't want to demean it, it was a great summer. And we laughed a lot, and we cried a lot, and we had a lot of really hard conversations. Sometimes I was angry, sometimes they were angry. (laughs) It just depended on what day it was and how hot it was the night before without air conditioning. Not that I'm bitter. I'm working on bitterness. I think it's really important to note at the bottom of this slide that Jesus fills all of these holes. All of the places where we want things to be all about me, Jesus made it all about me on the cross. Greed is about our heart. (laughs) Do I have to keep going through this? I don't need to go through every one of these, do I? Jesus solves every single one of these problems in the way that he loves and cares for me. Jesus became the glory of God, the visible expression of God's visible reality. And he alone can manage this idea of greed and idolatry. And we move from there on to generosity. We talked about a handful of stories We compared what generosity looks like for the wealthy in two stories in particular. One in a man that said yes to Jesus and one in a man that did not. And in one of those two stories, you see somebody going away really excited and happy with their new life, generous in every way, and the other going away sad because he loved what he had. And we talked about generosity for the poor. One of the most famous giving passages in all the scriptures in 2 Corinthians, it says, God loves a cheerful giver, but I don't know that we realize that the beginning of this passage talks about the fact that it was the Corinthians that were giving to Paul and his ministry out of their poverty that led to those, that conversation. That generosity is not something that's strictly for the wealthy, but that it's for everyone. Another theme that you will notice throughout the course of our summer and we spent an awful lot of time talking about the fact that God's way is always the best way to live. Is always the easiest way to go through life. We just struggle a lot to believe that it's true. Lastly, we talked about the parable that has been renamed by every preacher under the sun. Prayer the parable of the prodigal father, prodigal son, tale of two sons, whatever you'd like to call it. I like to call it the parable of the prodigal father. The definition of prodigal is wasteful extravagance. And if you want to look at the father in this story, whether it's with his love, his possessions, 
his time, his energy. He was really wasteful with the way he loved his kids. And as a representation of God the Father, to me, this applies. And it applies to you. God has been incredibly wasteful with his resources simply to be able to redeem us and build a bridge to himself that we could cross it and be with him forever. That's really cool. We'll skip over most of the sex and sexuality stuff, but I do want to touch on singleness and marriage briefly. Two truths and two myths about singleness. First, the myths that single means being alone and lonely and that that's the only option. And myth two, that single means because there's nobody else around, I can do whatever I want. Nobody to answer to. Sorry, am I allowed to dance in church? All right. The truth of the matter is that being single uniquely glorifies God and images the gospel. And that being single gives an opportunity to learn and trust God with contentment and happiness. When singleness is done well, it images the gospel. I do not need anything other than Jesus to be safe, content, happy, flourishing in my life. I hadn't intended to go here, but here we go. Could we please stop in the framework of our churches looking at single people and going, oh, we've got to find you somebody. You are not valuable enough just as you are because God has claimed you as his child. You need somebody else, male, female, or otherwise. And can we celebrate the imaging of God that is simply them loved and cared for by Creator? Step down off that soapbox and move on. Marriage. Marriage talks through the difference between transactional relationships and covenantal relationships. In society, we love to use relationships as currency. This relationship gets me this, this relationship gets me this, this relationship gets me this, and again, theme warning, me, 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 all the way through all of those things. Covenantal relationship is a sacrificial giving of each other to each other that allows for something different. We talked about variables in deciding who to marry, time, time of life, maturity, uh, intimacy and views of intimacy, uh, commitment and, di- and direction for life. But these were some of the things that stuck out most. Some things that marriage is not. Marriage is not the solution to all your problems. In fact, it will create a few. Marriage is not freedom from sexual sin and or temptation which means we need to take care of our people in those areas and make sure that we don't pretend that they're invisible and don't exist. Otherwise, people will continue to go through lives feeling that their sexual failure, whether it's on the computer or in other ways, is simply them and them alone, and they live deep and mired in their shame. Can we please bring it into the light and deal with it, honestly and earnestly? Marriage is not about you and your needs. <laughs> Marriage is not as easy as it looks or seems. I'm not making contact with her, don't worry. Marriage is not without conflict, pain, or suffering. This idea that God will never give us more than we can handle, I believe to be a myth. And if you would like to look at that, talk to any parent who's lost a child. And it was a parent who lost a child that said that earlier this summer. Some things that marriage is, marriage is. Marriage is a reminder of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit's eternal relationship. Marriage is a picture of the gospel of forgiveness and acceptance, and that happens every day, both in the gospel and in my marriage, sometimes on the way to church. Not today, of course. I'm I'm preaching today, so I'm holier today than usual. Um, Marriage is a covenant for life. Marriage is an expression of love, commitment, intimacy, submission, and sacrifice, and that also images the gospel. 
And lastly, marriage is about denying oneself for the highest good of the other. Before we move on, every single one of these pieces, as I've said before, I'm not interested in giving you information. My heart for you and for the students that we work with is that through the information that we disseminate, God would use it and begin to transform us from the inside. That's my goal in sharing these things. It's my goal in being away for the summer because it's not about the information, it's about the people. All the things that we talked about at the very beginning lead to one place, and this will be the hardest thing that we talk about this morning. And I was told after the first service not to apologize for it. If it's truly about other people, then we need to examine ourselves and what our tree is. What type of fruit are we bearing? And there's a piece of self-examination that needs to happen, and I don't need to condemn anybody, and I don't need to, to judge anybody necessarily, although that's another myth that we're not supposed to do that in the body of Christ. That's another sermon. The reality is, is that the product of the work that I do with the navigators and that my goal for you at work as you engage in social justice, as you deal with your money and power, and as you deal in your marriages and things, my goal for you is that you find wholeness and fullness of life. My goal is that you would bear fruit. The Bible says you can tell a tree by the type of fruit it produces. The difficulty with this particular conversation is that this all of a sudden feels like the bad news of the gospel and not the good news of the gospel. Please realize that in my saying this to you, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I want to share with you just briefly some of the greatest joy that has ever come across me in my personal journey not to brag to you that it's there, but to invite you to something similar. Because when we talk about wholeness and fullness and joy in the gospel, this is where I found it in greater ways than any other. It comes in the form of spiritual generations. That top left corner, you'll see a picture with me and two men, Mike Whitney and Craig Parker. Craig was with me down in Boston this summer. These are the first two men I met in the Navigators. The very first conversation that I had with Mike Whitney went something like this. So tell me how your personal quiet time looks. Sound like a fun first conversation? And yet it wasn't mean-spirited or judgmental. It was a question to say if God is doing something in your life and you're finding it through the Scripture, I'd really like to know what God's doing. And we move from the bad news of the gospel, how's your quiet time, to the good news of the gospel, that God is at work, I'd like to hear what he's doing. It's a shift in posture that I would like to see us begin to make. The picture immediately below has some people you might recognize in it. (laughs) Yeah, that's you in there, front row, next to Ariel. (laughs) It's from our first year of ministry uh, on a trip we took down to Washington. Uh, to work at a homeless shelter. I don't think the homeless shelter had, it was impacted in any way by our work, but I think we were impacted by the work at the homeless shelter. I can walk through that picture and find pastors and youth workers and people who are engaged in their church, people who have been on staff with the Navigators. But the person I kind of want to focus on is all the way to the right. Her name is Julia. And Julia came to the the navigators out of the place that I had worked beforehand at St. Dom's and moved into our basement. And she and a friend of hers started up a Bible study uh, on the campus. And through that relationship, you'll notice up above, I met this young man here whose name is Jared. And Jared is her little brother, he came to be part of our ministry. And I ran into Jared and Lexi who are just off to this side here this past weekend at a wedding. And it was great to realize that it really is in that picture there that I am removed from this chain of generations. 
and that the generations has continued long beyond far and without me, as though I had anything to do with them in the first place. Jared and Lexi got married. You'll see the wedding pictures just below. One of the girls that came out of Julia's Bible study was this girl, Lexi, who ended up marrying her brother. I had the opportunity to meet with, with Jared. Julia met with Lexi. Lexi and Jared met with two students, one named Leah, one named Jordan, and it was their wedding that we celebrated. Their first conversations were something along the lines of, can you tell me what you're getting out of a quiet time? As they met together one-on-one, intentionally to talk about what they're getting out of Scripture, even when the answer was nothing. Cool, let's do that now then. And began to walk through discipleship relationships. Lexi ended up meeting this girl next to her, who you've probably seen up here leading worship from time to time, whose name is Allie, and began pulling on Allie's heart. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> crying in the front row, I'm going to be crying up here. This is the joy of it, though. It's unbelievable. And I invite you to it. As a result, in no small way, of their relationship, and Allie was at the wedding this weekend as well. Allie started a Bible study in her dorm room and met another young woman named Jordan, who you'll see at the top of this little pyramid picture over here, who you also see here on Sunday mornings, who gave her life to Christ as a result of the relationships that have gone on and gone on and gone on. And some of you have benefited in the form of being able to mentor some of these young women and sit down and have conversations that sound something like this. Hey, how's your quiet time going? How's your time alone with God? Are we a church that can feed ourselves there yet? I would love to be involved with teaching us how to have quiet time. I would love for this service to be the least effective thing we do as a church. And that we actually learn to grow in intimacy and intentionality with getting to know who God is. Because I'll tell you this as we move into the, this last slide. You saw the Great Commission on the slide. We do not get to go forward and be effective in any way inside of the Great Commission unless we begin to master some of these things here and learn to abide in the vine. And then, somehow in a supernatural way, as we begin to abide in Christ in ways that I cannot explain to you because they are far outside of my understanding, we begin to see crazy things happen. We begin to see fruit. And what ends up happening is that we find a different place of joy than we've experienced in any other way. My invitation to you is to join in in the celebration. To be able to understand in a different way what wholeness really looks like in the body of Christ. Recognizing that fruit is not a command that we're just forced to obey grudgingly, but that it actually is a place of celebration that we get to enjoy. And that it's a real place. And that it's all something that comes because we focus more on people than the other things that are around. People are the highlight of God's creation. And people, as they invest deeply in the scriptures and deeply in understanding who God is, and as God begins to work in supernatural ways, actually become the glory of God, the visible representation of an invisible God as he lives inside of us. We get to be a part of it all. How cool is that? And that is the good news of the gospel. That is the good news of the fruit that we get to bear. And it will change everything about the way you deal with these have-to checklist, begrudging, frustrating things that are put in front of us. Because without that, that's what this is. It's just more stuff to do. It's more stuff that we have to work on and work harder at to try to accomplish, and that's not the goal. The goal is rest. The goal is an easy 
burden. That's what Jesus promises us. But this is also abundant life. This is life to the full. And it's not accomplished anywhere else. I'll make many claims of exclusivity, but that is one that I will make. That full life is found in Christ and nowhere else. My invitation is that you join me in getting to know him more and more. Even when we fail. In fact, especially when we fail. It's an appropriate time to spend some time remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus.